intro. Uh, my name is Anthony Liferario, product manager at Pure Storage. I've uh, been at Pure Storage for about five years in a variety of engineering and product roles. Um, and what I'm here to talk about in this uh, talk is how to consume a cloud storage service. And really the intention here is to talk, is to take the perspective of someone who wants to access storage and get it from, from Fusion and how that works, how that feels, and how that lines up with the expectations of developers who are used to consuming cloud resources. So quick disclaimer, uh, the product we're showing here is not released yet. Um, so please take into account that these are forward-looking statements uh, in that respect. So quick touch point on Pure Fusion. Um, if you're you know, interested, essentially Pure Fusion is a cloud management model um, for uh, providing storage that Pure Storage offers. A um, couple of cool capabilities from a developer's perspective is that this is an instant uh, self-service provisioning capability. Same API that you'd wanna access, whether that's in the public cloud or whether that's in an on-premises use case. The way you integrate, the way you access storage is a cloud native model. Uh, and it's portable. So as a developer, let's take a look at what the model is, right? So as, you know, and just to give a bit of background, um, the previous role I had to working as a product manager on the Fusion product was as a developer on our cloud block store system. So on a day in day out basis, I was developing an application that consumes storage from a public cloud, you know, with a full CI CD harness, all of this stuff. So to me, this is very real and personal, right? So. What do I expect, right? I expect a way to access this system. Um, I expect a way to sandbox myself. I expect a way to get storage. And I expect a way to do that without you bothering me too much, right? So when I see tenants, tenant spaces, placement groups, volumes, these are gonna be the primary things I'm worrying about. Um, and then the policies that I'm gonna to use to request those things. So also behind the scenes, I know there's some infrastructure running somewhere, but uh, that's not really what I'm worried about. So when I see tenants and tenant spaces, what I think is this. Okay, I know what my AWS account is. I know that I make VPCs. Okay, I see a parallel here, right? I can namespace myself. I can drop myself into this environment. Not a problem, understood, right? Okay, now we're in a tenant space. How do I actually deploy my application? Let's take, let's take a, you know, a realistic case where I have an application that requires you know, a few different types of storage. Say I need some relatively low performance storage for my boot volume uh, in you know, this database application that I have. I need a couple of high performance volumes to write to. I need something you know, where I can point my backups to this kind of thing, right? I have a set of these applications or these volumes that I need. And what I can do is I'm expecting to look at the services that are available, understand what's there and use that to make my decisions. So when I take my developer eyes and I look at this, I say, okay, storage service one, this is the high performance storage service. Great, I understand that. Everything in here is gonna get snapshotted together. Cool, okay. I'll provision the bulk of my database application here, right? So I'll pick storage classes for those high performance volumes that I need. I'll pick a storage class that also works in here for my boot volume because you know I probably need a crash consistent snapshot of this, right? And okay, got it. Slap down placement group number one. Okay, now I need the spot for my backup. Okay, where, what do I need for that? Okay, well, I'm, I have much lower expectations in terms of performance for this. Let me pick a different storage service that's offering me uh, you know, less latency response. I don't care about that, right? It's a, it's a cheaper price. My bosses are gonna be happy, right? So second placement group, this is where my backup volumes are gonna go. Easy to understand, easy to, easy to sort of think about as a developer and lay out the application expectations that I have. Not a problem, right? The whole, th the whole point here is, as a developer, this is going to give you access to things you need in ways you're going to understand, right? And you're not going to have to worry about. Nobody's telling me about storage arrays. I don't care about that, right? Simple enough. Now looking at the policies. Storage service. Um, okay, so I need block storage. Okay, here's a, here's a storage service that, that offers me block. I, I need high performance. Okay, also in there. Um, this one has uh, certain replication capabilities um, and it's the iSCSI storage. Okay, good. I know that, easy. Next one, storage class. So I list out the storage classes and I see several, right? Okay, I'm used to storage classes. I'm a Kubernetes guy, right? I understand this, right? So what I look at is I say, okay, well, for my database performance uh, volumes, I need the highest performance storage that I can get because we're gonna hammer IO through this thing. I, okay, pick those. Oh, and I need a storage class that has much, much lower limits for that boot volume we talked about, right? So easy enough for me to understand storage classes and make a selection there. Post access policy. I get to define this if I need to. If my infrastructure is already there, um, this will be sitting there waiting for me. 
This is how I connect. Nothing big, nothing too complicated here. Protection policy. Okay, so now we're talking about you know, my backups. Well, I know that the backup team has some policy. I don't really remember what it is, um, but I probably should send them an email. Oh, wait, I don't have to do that. I can just list what protection policies are here. And one of them is gonna be called database backup. And if I can know that that's the one that the, uh, the backup team worked with our storage or our infrastructure folks to get defined for me. I can just pick that and use that, right? So simple enough for me to understand that as well. I don't have to worry about the connectivity between boxes. All I have to know is either what SLA I want or what SLA the people who get to tell me what to do want, right? And I can pick that. From an availability zone perspective, I don't know about anything under this hood. I'm just worried about my servers, my storage network, and how I get access to my volumes. So when I see that there's a storage endpoint with a certain addresses, I plug those into my machine. And once I've created my volumes, I can grab the IQN, plug that in there, and that's all I need to know. For me, the availability zone is really useful for thinking about fault tolerance, it's useful for thinking about locality. Those are the kinds of decisions I, as a developer, need to think about when approaching Fusion and looking at the topology layout, right? And when I think about these object models and use cases, I'm worried about how I'm laying my application out. I don't care about what's underneath here. All I know is I'm targeting workload to different uh, regions and different availability zones. It doesn't matter to me what's going on under the hood. And Fusion offers me the ability to define and architect and lay out the storage layer of my application without asking any more of me than that. All right, what does Fusion offer me in terms of API and SDKs? You know, we've talked about the object model. It seems reasonable enough. Someone's offering me services. I can get those services, not, not too big of a deal. Fusion for me is an API driven product with a console GUI available. I'm used to this. I know the AWS console. That's not a big deal for me to think about but probably I'm gonna use the API to access it. I can make direct API calls. I can build my own SDK off of the swagger that's available. I can use the first party supported Python or Go SDKs if that meets my need. I can use infrastructure as code if my system is Terraform driven or Ansible driven, you know, whatever, that, whatever I need, I can choose that. Um, I could use a command line as well. You know, when I'm first playing around with this system, that's probably what I'm gonna to go to because it's super easy. But when I go to actually productionize my app or I go to build something into my pipeline, I'm not gonna use the CLI. I'm gonna use you know, whichever tool is appropriate given the rest of my system. And are all of these um, interfaces going through the same central point? That's right. So serialization, if you're trying to use multiple of them, it will... Um, so serial, so uh, if you try to access let me, let me try to guess what you mean by serialization. I'm trying to do two things at the same time using two different interfaces that talk to the same platform, like create or delete or do something. Sure. sure. And then, you know, how does that conflict get resolved? Sure. So there's, there's an initial race there in terms of who's going to arrive first. Now, this is assuming you're talking to the same underlying object. That underlying object, a lock will be taken on that object by whoever gets to it first. The second person will get a comprehensible error message saying, you know, this object that you're trying to modify is, is under use, right? So in terms of direct single object parallelism, we, we guard against that. In terms of broad parallelism for the system, Fusion itself is designed for, you know, super, super wide, right? We're talking, you know, hundreds and thousands of underlying storage domains, like arrays, whatever. Um, and, you know, I would be, I would be, you know, remiss in my job as a product manager if I couldn't support you know, hundreds and hundreds of API calls per second, for instance, right? So that's, uh, I'm not too worried about that part, but in terms of single object uh, serialization, that's how it Yeah, works. I just think it's important that you, you should not have to feel like you can't go and use any methodology yeah. Yeah. to do this. Well, the way that I think about it, right, is even if you look at the GUI, the console, right, that's just a wrapper on top of the API from my perspective, just the same way that all of these are. So even the command line tool, right, it's just an API forwarder in my mind. So everything is really actually coming in, making the same calls through the same uh, interface, you know, speaking the same language. And you know, if you're going to race yourself by trying to do things from a different perspective, we'll try to help you with that. So from a provider standpoint, before we throw out any GUI options, uh, are are there um, any benefits potentially? I would assume that there's going to be you know a lot of alerting and messaging that you might need to know as a provider. Is is there any? benefit that you might get out of seeing that from a, a GUI console versus just getting an email or something in a Slack channel? 
Sure. If we step if we step back from the the consumer persona and into the uh, provider persona, absolutely right. But what I would say is, all of that is going to be available from Fusion via API as well, right? So so while you know a uh, a certain enterprise, a certain user, a certain group's operational model may prefer that kind of interface, uh, we're not going to restrict you to that. So the tools that are available for me as a developer all make sense, right? I have access to the different things I might want. What about the API itself? How does the API work? Am I going to be you know, shooting myself in the foot by deciding to build against this, right? First of all, it's asynchronous. And this goes back to a little bit what we said before where get calls are synchronous, but they're against the last known good state of the system. Um, all modification operations are asynchronous in a task-based model we call operations, right? So when you do uh, a modification, that modification is going to create an operation and return that to you immediately. You can check against that operation um, to see whether it succeeded, you know, whether there's an error, all this kind of stuff. You can do that against the operation object. And when that operation closes, known good state of the system will represent that, right? So that's the, that's the simple way to do this. The idea here is if you're building Fusion into a large environment and you, you know, want to, you know, follow good programming practices, we're not going to force you to lock a thread on waiting for an eight hour data migration or something, right? Like there's no reason to do that. <laughs> so um, all of this is with the intention of being built into larger scale systems. We'll have convenience capabilities for, you know, synchronizing things in SDKs and other tools. But in general, the philosophy here is that's not good programming practice for building real products. Um, second one, declarative and idempotent. So I've made reference to this uh, a little bit throughout here, but um, really what we're saying here is the API call uh, expresses your desired state of the system uh, and making a call that requests that same state multiple times is not going to cause any turbulence because you're just asking for a certain state, right? And we will handle that. This also means that we're taking responsibility in Fusion for rollback. So if we can't get you to that desired state, we will get you back to where you were before. So the idea here is this makes it much, much you know, easier for you to just make the call you want, not worry about if you ask for the same thing twice, so on and so forth. Um, and the last one is throughput optimized. As I mentioned before, we are uh, we are looking to support huge environments here and significant parallelism. So, you know, we are we are focused on allowing tons and tons of this management traffic to come through our front doors without you know causing us any bother, without affecting the array's performance at all, the underlying storage. So, a question on that: Do you yeah. have any real numbers that you could reveal on that? Like, what does massive mean? You know how many so i can't i don't have any numbers that i can give you today on that okay what, what i can what i can say directionally is that we're looking at environments with thousands of arrays thousands so, of arrays yeah okay so it roughly would translate to x amount of storage roughly i mean you know we can spit all the math but what if we said it was 250 terabytes per array you know whatever okay that's sure. that's great sure. thanks I, yeah no worries. The, the, the thing about this system, right, is that, you know, people have called it out as maybe more of a management uh, horizontal uh, scale out rather than a deeply linked technical scale out. So for us, the number of arrays isn't, you know, terribly significant in terms of the burden on the system, except in the management traffic that it generates. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm looking at this, right, as a developer, I can see I can create a volume. You know, this is a screenshot from our swagger, right? So nothing too dramatic here. But what you'll see is that returns a request, gives me the object I expect. If I query against that request, or, or sorry, that operation, uh, then I will see the uh, state of the operation. Uh, after that operation is completed, I can go back and get against that volume, and I will see the known good state of that system since the uh, operation has closed. You know, in terms of documentation, we're following all the you know open API best practices here. Swagger, um, we'll have generated documentation plus additional documentation. Um, you know, as as a developer, I just want to be able to look at the stinking documentation, right? Don't make me download a PDF. That, you know, that's the idea here. Now, in terms of uh, a quick demo from the developer side, what I'm trying to show here is something that's very real world to me, which is in a CI system, right? I need the ability to easily script. Uh, the deployment and redeployment of an application. So what we're going to imagine here is that we're taking that database application I mentioned before, and as a part of the CI system for building that system, that application, um, there's a containerized build system. And that container is going to execute as one of its, uh, it could be multiple containers in a sequence, so let's not worry about that, right? But um, it's going to execute a script 
which is going to go into Fusion and request the resources that it needs. So what I've got is a simple sort of Python script that combines all the steps required to deploy um, that database application that I have. And this is relatively naively written. There's not a heck of a lot of um, you know, deep uh, protection against myself here. Um, but what you can see is we'll be configuring Fusion, we'll be collecting and setting up the API, then we'll be going in, creating my tenant space, right? Then creating the placement group. So this is a very similar workflow to what we saw uh, in the past with CLI. Then I'm going to be defining the volumes. So all of my volumes are defined here. Very simple to define, you know, what those post requests look like. Executing that volume creation. Then I can do host access, right? So I can take uh, a host access policy um, and then I can patch that onto my volumes and I'll have access to it. Right, so the intention here is if we remember that this is a build step uh, in my CI pipeline. But what we'll do is we will follow through this entire process and I as a developer only have to write this once. I hook this into my Jenkins job or whatever other CI system that you have. And as a part of you know, that system, I can easily consume storage. And none of this references any arrays or any of that. Right? This is all about policy and all about asking for that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna export a couple of uh, environment variables. So if you're thinking about the container, these are injected environment variables that you know give me the permission to do what I need to do. These are like private keys and things like that. So I'll inject a couple of environment variables into this container runtime that I have, and then I'll execute this script. And so all we can see is that we're just getting responses back from the API. And in my build system, I would expect this to print to the log, and then I would expect that log to get stored. And so if, it, if an error happens in my test job somewhere, I would dive in and expect to see these logs. So to me, this is a very practical example of what a developer expects from a cloud system and from an as a service infrastructure system, right? So the, the whole purpose of this is to show that as a developer, when you give me Fusion, I'm not getting something, you know, weird. I'm getting a cloud storage system. And you know, that's the whole point. Quick question. Um, do you have um, like a, I don't know, a repository of scripts that maybe developers could go out and download and edit? Yeah, so um, we are not GA yet with the product, so we haven't released that, but you can expect you can expect things like that, yeah. Do you have also a mechanism to manage, you know, not troubleshooting, but if there is something wrong with the, with the system, okay? Because we talked about a lot of provisioning, but actually, even as a developer, the yep. API, maybe I want to query the system to understand if yeah. everything is okay, if there is a problem. Yeah, yeah. So we will have, like I mentioned before, a ways, ways to query against alerts, uh, as, as the previous question uh, indicated. Those alerts will be filtered appropriately, you know, based on who the audience is, who's asking for it. Uh, in addition, we will have the ability to query metrics against the objects that are created. So if I was a consumer uh, developer and I had created uh, some storage, requested some storage, um, and I wanted to see if that storage was you know, getting high latency or having issues, I wanted to see what was happening there, we'll have metrics endpoints uh, available for that. So the intention is to do, to support those kinds of troubleshooting use cases, yeah. What about rate limiting? So, you know, some developers are good at writing code, some are potentially not so good at writing code. <laughs> it might write something that accidentally goes and tries to create 100,000 volumes very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah. How about rate limiting or trying to you know, restrict around things like that? Yeah, so, you know, I don't think, you know, rate limiting is something we've explicitly drawn out in the you know, initial version of this product, but what you're getting at aligns with our strategy. So the place where we're starting is we're starting with limits on individual volumes, and then we'll be working up towards larger and larger, uh, both uh, quota type aggregations, uh, as well as API level um, uh, rate limiting. Yeah, I, I use the term rate, rate limiting. I, I mean, effectively, quotas or whatever. I was just thinking yeah. that runaway processes where somebody's coded something really badly. If you're in a group of people, you while don't... true, run this script. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah my sort of programming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's some. Uh, it's definitely something we'll take into account.